from me, Roy Mistoch, and welcome to Derach Eretz, The Way of the World. In today's show, Sarah Evian considers the topic of social activism within Judaism. We meet up with Peter Dirk Ace in Darling and find out about the Angel Network, who has taken social activism to the next level. Modern Orthodox Rabbi Haskell Lukstein once commented about social activism and Judaism that it is the Talmud that states that no man is free unless he has economic opportunity, a chance for employment. Sarah Evian elaborates further. We're talking about social activism and um, specifically in the, in the Jewish culture, the Jewish tradition. And we see that social activism in the Torah is, is a very, very strong point. It is a point that is hinted at in, ma in many places. And the first place we actually see social activism, strangely, is when God tells Abraham that he's going to come into Sodom because he's unhappy with the way the city is running. It's full of unkindness and cruelty and, and God is not happy with it. And so he says that he, he's thinking of destroying it. And Abraham comes in and protests so strongly and his wording in the Torah is, shall the judge of the earth not do justice? And that is the first time that we see that, that someone is actually protesting about the injustice in the world. And that's right in the very beginning of Torah. And all along the way, we're given a very strong directive in Torah that our job on earth is to give every single human being dignity. Um, every human being alive has got a right to live, to freedom, and, and that all of us collectively are responsible for each other in this. So in our directive to be social activists, all of us in our lives, we have to be very careful in what direction this takes. And we see as a nation when we were leaving Egypt, when we had our first taste of freedom, we are told very specifically that we are being released and liberated from Egypt in order to serve God. We weren't only being liberated from Egypt in order to become free. Because freedom is a very strange thing. Freedom often leads us to a much more enslaved kind of life, whether we are enslaved to ideology or to, to social media or whatever it is that enslaves us in our lives. It's very easy when we make our own decision and our own choices what we, in, what we enslave ourselves to. And so right at the very beginning of our liberation, we are told, have in front of you some sort of system which is higher than yourself. Because we are all limited people and our limitation is as far as we can see. And we see in the history of the world, there have been many social activists who fought for an ideology they call it a revolution. And the strange thing is that a revolution actually is 360 degrees. So a social activist comes along and fights for an ideology and that follows a certain path. And what happens in the end is that it's become a revolution. It's gone 360 degrees and it arrives at the same place with a different despot, different rules, but the same enslavement for people where there hasn't been a liberation. And so in the world, we see that very often. That's really been the history of, of it. But nonetheless, it's very important for each of us to be a social activist in our lives, our personal lives and in our environment and certainly in the, the global. We have a responsibility to do that. And we see also in the Torah, that the first directive that's given, the first mitzvah to us is not to focus on the rights of everyone, which is my right, but to focus on my responsibility. And that is a very important part because I can scream and shout for my rights to be fulfilled, but unless I'm actually looking at what my obligation is outwardly, the world is not going to be a better place because it's it's each of our responsibility to take that and make ourselves better people and unlift the environment around us. For all of us, we need to be social activists. In the greater world, we need to be the Nachshon ben Aminadav, 
who walked into the sea and make it split for everyone else. And we also need to be the social activist for myself personally and for my, my environment and for the greater world. Peter Dirk Ace was born in Cape Town in 1945. Involved in theatre since the mid-1960s, he has written and performed 20 plays and over 30 reviews and one-man shows throughout South Africa and abroad. Since 2000, Peter Dirk Ace and his alter ego, Evita Besaidenhout, and various other characters have been travelling around South Africa, visiting prisons, reformatories and over 1.5 million school children bringing to the fore issues related to HIV and AIDS awareness. I am an entertainer. That's, that's the most important description for me. Um, people have said an activist. I don't uh, know. Actorvist, maybe. And I write uh, and I perform. But the most important thing is I produce entertainment and then um, Having been unemployed since 1975, um, I have to become my job. So if I do nothing, nothing happens. If I do something, everything happens. My mother was Jewish, but we only found that out after she was dead. We never talked about it when my mother was alive because it wasn't an issue, although she had many, many Jewish friends. We had many Jewish friends and they made music with us and we loved them. Um, I always thought my mother was Lutheran because she used to take us to the Lutheran German church for the music. And when I actually found out um, some years later, again from friends in Germany, uh, I was thrilled. I was, uh, okay, okay, happy. Because I always sensed it and now I'm happy. And I love saying that I'm a Jewish Afrikaner or an Afrikaner Jew. At least I belong to both chosen people. My mother uh, came to South Africa in 1937 with her piano. And her parents were already in Cape Town. And the first job she got as a concert pianist was on the stage of the City Hall playing a double Mozart concerto with a South African pianist called Hannes Ace, my pa. So she and my father met on the stage. Um, so I always thank two people for my life, Amadeus and Adolf. And she committed suicide. She jumped off Chapman's Peak. And that was the end of the family. We had to start again. We had to we had to sort of strap up our wounds and just limp through the rest of our lives. Um, and it is something you never recover from, but it's something you never forget. The extraordinary experience of, my, of Tessie, my sister, she was in Germany, at the, in, in Berlin, in the Jewish Museum. Somebody took her there and she met one of the young curators and uh, they were talking about this and that. And of course, Tessie said, my mother comes from Charlottenburg and being Jewish and blah, blah pianist and he said I want to show you our exhibition of Heimat und Exil, Heimat, Home and Exile. And there was this depiction of a Charlottenburg uh, apartment of a Jewish family and everything. Many of the furnishings there, Tessie said, was like the furniture we had at home which had come to Cape Town with my grandparents. But there was no piano. And she said, where's the piano? Every Jewish family had a piano. He said, you know, we haven't really found one. She said, I've got one. I've got the piano that my mother brought from Berlin all the way to Cape Town in 1937. It's in Pinelands. I'll send it back to you. And it's now there in the museum in a permanent exhibition. And every time I go back, I do a show there. Um, and I'm doing my, my new one-man show, which is a, a memoir called The Echo of a Noise. And I'll be doing it there for one night in May. Peter Dirk Ace. I've always been in awe of his incredible mind, how he opens up people's mind. Firstly, of course, through his alter ego, Evita Bosodenhout, but he has become a political commentator of South African politics par excellence. A friend of mine um, introduced me to a, an editor uh, at the Sunday Express, the Sunday newspaper, and he said, do you know, you're just what I'm looking for. I'll give you a column every week, a little column in the newspaper, 100 words. Give us a reflection of how you see South Africa today. This was 1978 the time of the information scandal, when suddenly we found out that the National Party government was stealing money. And so I was hearing all the things that were happening behind closed doors, 
about this scandal. And I thought, how do I put this across in the column? I'll create an Afrikaans tani who at a party at Pretoria can say, Scotty, have you heard? And then she would come out. And this is what happened. Once a month, this lady would say whatever was, was uh, being said. And eventually, about six months later, the editor said to me, do you know, how do you get away with it? I can't say they put those things on the front page because of censorship and self-censorship. And... But you've got this woman who talks about these things, this Evita of Pretoria. So the name came from somebody else. And then when my first one-man show happened, Adapt or Die, 1981, Evita, this character, Tani Evita, was known by the readers. And I thought, well, I'll start the show with her in pink hat and gloves and all that. And, and there she became, she, she came uh, into the chorus line. But really, truly, I thought she was just one of the chorus line. But you know, she came at a very, I think at the right time, 1981. The media, specifically the media, needed somebody to, again, tease the government with, not with a finger wag, you know, or, or with, a, with, with shouting, but with this African stunny. So Evita has lasted ever since then. I mean, it's like nearly 35, 36 years. Evita Besaidnet has been part of people's lives. His work um, is known beyond our shores, and it is for his satire and his wit and in enabling the government to look at themselves and look at their foibles and possibly have a change of opinion and a change of mind, which I believe made the change in South Africa more tolerable. And he always commented on the wicked sins of the past with such enormous humor. And he will go down in history as almost changing the face of South African politics and changing the mindset of South Africans and certainly our politicians. It's very interesting to sit here in 2017 and, and um, look back. Uh, and then people say things like, you know, when did you really decide? to use comedy to fight apartheid, all those. I never thought of those things. It was creating a sort of an anarchy um, and also realizing that there is a difference between comedy and humor. Comedy is the joke. And it, of course, you have to be funny for an audience to come and enjoy themselves. But humor is not always funny. And I think humor is very much a personal reality, meaning that I laugh because I have recognized my fear. I think it's got a lot to do with my enormous respect and love for Jewish humor. For example, the reality of the concentration camps, the reality of survivors, the reality of, as a little boy, I once asked a Jewish friend of my mother's, is that a telephone number? And she said, why don't you phone and see who answers? And laughed. So my first introduction to that hell was with humor. He is also, as you know, not only a social commentator, mirror, mirroring our society, but he's a theater activist. And his work on AIDS awareness and education, educating people um, for voting, and of course, gay rights is, is absolutely outstanding. In 2000, I was suddenly aware of government going into denial about HIV. I realized that I had my second virus, apartheid was the first virus, and AIDS was it. And I had to actually confront my own terror of, and fear of HIV and AIDS. And I thought, how do I do this? Where do I do this? What do I do with it? I'll do a, a presentation for schools. I'll go to a school and I'll take them uh, characters and and I'll talk about this and so, because they haven't been exposed to sex. Oh, ha, ha, you know, I still thought, oh, they're only 18 and they get married and then they have sex. They have sex at the age of 10. It was, an, again, instinctive. Um, and, and so I've been, I mean, I, it was a huge focus on that during those years of denial when the government was not doing its job. So I still have that with me and I still travel around with, with that. Um, and for me, it's one of the greatest inspirations in the world talking to the young generation who uh, are 12, who are 14 years old, and I'm 71. What makes Peter a mensch? Well, a mensch is a human being that is empathetic. It's almost like Ubuntu. And I think he personifies Ubuntu because he is warm and understanding to the people that 
surround him, to the people he works with. My staff always love working for him because they know exactly what he, he knows exactly what he wants. And um, he's a perfectionist, but he's always kind and fair to everybody. And I think that simplif simply exemplifies the word mensch, a nice, good human being. What began as a small group of volunteers packing toiletries for state hospital patients grew into six strangers with one goal, to offer help wherever help was needed by giving a hand up rather than a hand out. Today, co-founder Glyn Wallman and her team have grown Angel Network into a 15,000 member strong volunteer organization. The call of Glenn Wallman and her team is for people to do whatever they can to cater for the constant needs of so many who have so little. The Angel Network is a non-profit organization run purely on social media. We assist orphaned and vulnerable children in six provinces across our country with food, education, clothing and housing. We work with over 50 charities and outreach programs to assist these children. How the Angel Network came about was as a result of things happening in our country that made me feel very despondent. And, and I was looking for an answer as to how things could change, but I had no idea where to start. I knew what I wanted to do, that I wanted to give back, help people who needed help. And I think it was divine intervention. I really think the Angel Network found me because a friend approached me to help pack a Santa shoebox but I've never been happy just doing one. I've always got to do more. So I approached friends, I put it on my Facebook page and I went to Joburg Jewish Mommies. And the next thing I had 65 Santa shoe boxes. And I thought, hmm, there's something here with social media. There's, there's something that can be used here. So I started speaking about possibly starting our own charity. I said, there's a lot to be said for social media. I think we need to look at starting our own Facebook page. And as they say, the rest is history. The Facebook page was born, the Angel Network was born. Run purely on social media, we get requests from orphanages, outreach centers, maternity homes, and we immediately put up the request on Facebook and we sit back and wait for the magic to happen. Our members then respond via social media. They either want to make monetary donations or in the case of where we're asking for things like school shoes, blankets, clothing, food, there'll be drop-off points that they'll deliver to and then we'll distribute to the places that need them. Nashua Children's Charity Foundation, headed up by Helen Fraser, have been instrumental in taking care of Banaka Kileni all the years and in making sure that the kids are looked after with school needs, school uniforms, bags, stationery, food. Little Steps then also came on board and helped with the things like the creche, the toilets, the fencing, the vegetable garden. And what's happened in the last few years, Lotto was helping sponsor Banaka Kileni. They've withdrawn that sponsorship. One year, in fact. It's been a year. Rose and her team weren't earning enough money to, make, to, to earn a living. They were doing it for the love of the children. And so they would get second-hand clothes, second-hand books, they'd sell them, and that would help them pay for themselves to be able to put food on their family's table. We were approached by both National Children's Charity Foundation and Little Steps to come on board and help out with things like blankets, jackets, backpacks, stationary food. And in fact, recently we made a donation of 25,000 Rand to help the staff here be able to earn a living. They can't work for nothing. They want to keep the center going, but they also need to live. We have asked our members now to do debit orders, which are now being put through monthly so that on a monthly basis, we can assist financially. Banaka Kaledi, stay ahead, stay open. Now these children who are here, it's a, they are orphans and vulnerable, vulnerable in the sense that some are abused emotionally, some are abused physically and otherwise. 
I wish you came when it was in a horrible state because now things are bad. And then we have a house mother, like a matron in our olden days who sleeps with the girls. Before they go to school, uh, they, 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 because it's small, you, you can see it. They, 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 they take turns to, to bath and then ready for, for breakfast. I never imagined the Angel Network would have almost 14,000 members one year down the line. So it's very hard to say where I see us going because we've, we've grown so unbelievably in such a short space of time. I thought we'd have a couple of hundred members. We are now starting to partner with companies like the Tomorrow Trust, Build the Future, Boys and Girls Club, where they are instrumental in starting creches and after school centers for children. And we are hoping to partner with them, get children from our outreach centers into their play schools, into their creches. And in time, we would like to develop training centers for children, for maths, for science, for accountancy, and then help empower kids to be able to find jobs after school, help them get into university, stay in university, and, and be employable and make a difference and give back afterwards. This is our kitchen area, and uh, it was horrible. I think during this two, two months ago, Ackermans renovated it. They put on these tiles. Otherwise, we had peel and stick tiles which were shifting. We prepare our meals here. All these are donations from supporters of the center. So the two ladies, Mrs. Shabalala and Chauge, prepare all the meals and then uh, before they knock off they'll see to it that their dinner is also ready so that they go to bed and then prepare their lunch boxes for the following day. The Angel Network could not exist without the kindness and generosity of its members. I could not do what I do without five incredible women who give me love support, time, commitment. Our committee, consisting of Haley Glasser, Janine Ways Broad, Lindy Katsoff, Bev Smith, and Giselle Wynick, make up the team behind the Angel Network. And really, without the, the five of them, we'd be nothing. To me, Derek Eretz is it's a way of life. It's a way of behaving. It's behaving the correct way. It's doing things respectfully and properly, I would, I would imagine. Maimonides is quoted as saying, the highest level of charity is to help others help themselves. This is most certainly true of the people we have met in today's show. We would love for you to join our conversation, so share your thoughts and stories on our Facebook page, Derek Eretz Connect. From me, Romy Stark, and the Derek Eretz team, we wish you a week ahead that is filled with deeds that uplift and inspire those around you. Mm -hmm.